Good morning, everybody. Um, it's 10 o'clock. I see there's still people joining, but we do have quite a tight agenda today. So I think we will start. Um, I'm Lizel McFarlane. I am the portfolio lead for the Excellence in Care and Healthcare Staffing Programmes um, within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on the call um, in what is our third of our winter webinar series that we are running. To date, we have had 360 attendees on our webinars. And I think today we've got another 260 people um, who are registered to attend today. So it looks like it's going to be another full session. Um, and we really do appreciate people taking time out of their um, very busy schedules to, to come and join us um, on these calls. So today um, we're looking at systems under pressure. Um, and when we consider that frontline teams are already stretched to the limit, um, we want some to discuss how, how we manage sur surge capacity. Um, we want to do that in a way that um, ensures that it meets the needs of the service. Um, but also um, is done safely. And if you, you, you use um, good planning and you have good planning in place, you can avoid sort of pitfalls um, that, that would compromise your patient care um, going forward. So today's speakers um, will be sharing their experiences of um, opening new wards or surge beds, um, some of which was done during the, the COVID period, but actually is, is the principles and the, the, the tools and resources used are equally um, relevant within our current context that we're in just now. Um, at the end of the session, we'll also be sharing um, a toolkit that we have developed that provides those tools and resources that will support teams through implementing these processes within the, um, the wards when they have to think about how they expand their capacity um, in the coming months. So before we go on any further, let's cover some housekeeping. So uh, next slide, please. You are all muted and your cameras are off um, for the time being. Um, we have two speakers today and um, feel free as we go along to pop any questions or comments in the chat box. Caroline is going to be um, scrutinising it carefully and we will um, take those questions at the end. Um, at the end, we'll also have our Q&A session, so as well as questions in the chat box, feel free to put your hand up and we will try and get through as many questions as we can. Just to let you know as well that um, the session will be recorded um, and the, the link to the recording will be circulated next week. Um, so if you're not speaking, if you can keep your camera off and keep yourself muted just to um, make sure that the, the speakers could be heard, that would be much appreciated. So our first speaker today is David MacArthur, OBE. David is the Senior Nurse for Corporate Services in NHS Highland. He initially trained as a mental health nurse, um, but specialised in intensive care and theatres. And throughout his career um, until 2019, he maintained a parallel role as an army medical services reservist and was the first nurse to hold the rank of brigadier. Um, David has a strong background in operational planning and uh, clinical simulation and has been responsible for building treatment facilities in adverse environments. So I think that made him an obvious choice for the Chief Nurse of Operations for the NHS, Louisa Jordan. So David, I am very um, happy to welcome you onto the call today and I will hand over to you. That's great, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, how did I become involved with the Louisa Jordan? Uh, I was Director of Nursing in NHS Orkney at the time. And late March 2020, the Scottish Government made the, the decision 
to open up the Louisa Jordan. Uh, shortly after that, I was in the I was in a SEN meeting uh, and the, the implications for what was going on uh, in, you know, in opening the, the Louisa Jordan uh, were being discussed. And clearly part of the discussion was who's going to run this thing. Uh, and in those days, we, we didn't have any teams in anything. We were doing it all on telephone. And I was quietly drinking my soup. Uh, listening, thinking, I'm up on an island. Nobody's going to want me to go down there and do this. Uh, and Mags McGuire, God bless her, uh, said, well, why don't we get David to do this? Because he's done this sort of stuff already. Uh, the call was then taken up by a uh, chief nursing officer, uh, Fiona McQueen. And I sort of choked it and she said, well, could you, would you mind coming down and doing this? I sort of choked on my soup a bit and said, well, and then the, the call dropped. So by the time I get back in the call, I found that I was now I was going to be the, the the head nurse for the internal operational clinical piece for the build of the Louisa Jordan, uh, and I had to get myself down to Glasgow very very quickly. Uh, so went down there, and you know the situation, as most of you will remember, was one of bed reducing reducing bed availability, tremendous efforts uh, in using existing staff and real estate to expand the capacity. And the response as elsewhere in the UK was to create a new temporary treatment facility where patients could be cared for during the post-acute phase of their illness, or their COVID illness. And in our case for the Louisa Jordan, it was within part of the criteria for admission was to be within five days of discharge to home. Uh, slide two, please. Uh, so I went down to Glasgow. Uh, with the sigh of relief from the rest of the nurse directors, who I have to say were absolutely fantastic in the support uh, throughout the, the process. Uh, and I couldn't praise them highly enough, uh, but I did feel myself getting dropped in it a wee bit. But uh, look forward to it nonetheless. So what were we supposed to provide there? Uh, incrementally, we were supposed to provide 40, then 80, then 120, then 300 beds with the capacity in the SEC to accommodate 1,200 beds, of which up to 30 of those beds would be intensive care beds, and that was fully piped, fully equipped, uh, and and ready to go within three weeks. So you can see there was probably a bit, there was a bit of a, a mountain to climb. Uh, we had to recruit and train our workforce, uh, and that was mainly volunteers from from across the health service, and some returned to practice folks. But we had to orientate and induct those those folks to the specific environment, which had compromises in terms of its functions, but not its safety, I hasten to add. A key element of the induction process uh, was engagement with the leadership team and visibility of that leadership team. And we had and we, we adopted a very deliberate uh, policy of being there on the ground when people were training and helped to support that training. Staff well-being was a key element of what we, we did because we could train and build the team, but we had to keep the team functional. We didn't know if we were going to open, you know, on the on the, the, the 23rd of April as a, as a working facility or whether we would have a bit of headroom. But we so we had to push on ahead and assume that we were going to have to hit the ground running. <clears throat> Pardon me. In terms of governance, we had to provide a governance structure. But we were able to start from scratch uh, and we were able to refine the system uh, to minimise bureaucracy and to provide assurance covering the clinical and non-clinical elements. In terms of infrastructure, the SEC and the hydro obviously are non-clinical environments, but they do go back to, in the case of the, the SEC, back to 1985 and in case of the hydro back to 95, and that showed in the, the fabric when we started to, to build. And we had to do a lot of route restorative work on plant ventilation, drainage and water supply, as well as bringing in showers, bringing in uh, toilets and bringing in porta cabins to accommodate the, the stores and things. Another part of it, of course, is that it was absolutely unprecedented. No similar task had been carried out previously in Scotland. So we were really treading in an unknown territory here 
and there truly was a mountain to climb. Slide three, please. The leadership and management structure was drawn from across Scotland, people who were currently employed, recently retired and external consultants. And from this very diverse group, the majority, although we, we, we did know each other, hadn't worked together previously, or if it been, if we had worked together, it'd been a long time ago. Uh, Colin McDowell, who was Director of Operations and I uh, had worked together before, uh, but that's when we were both RMN students in back in 1980 in Gartney Royal. So, you know, it didn't really count, but we did have experience and we did have that resilience that, we're, that we were able to, to, to draw on. And this was a very alien environment. We were literally building the aeroplane when we were trying, when we were learning to fly it. And it, it was, it, it did test us. Uh, but I have to say the the enthusiasm within the the uh, within the Louisa Jordan was was quite unbounded, and our workforce also came from came with varied experiences. So we also had to be very clear on establishing who was able to do what uh, and what that experience base was. So very quickly we needed to provide a trusted leadership. And we did that by providing early personal engagement, valuing individual contributions and involvement in the in decision making. Clarity of purpose uh, came very early on, developing the understanding within all staff uh, at all levels, not just of what the task ahead was going to be, but the reason why we were doing stuff and the effects of what we were doing not just on the in the immediate sense within Louisa Jordan, but elsewhere within the the the, the NHS. We just the scheme of delegation was about ensuring that everyone understood the plan and their part in it. And we operated on a dynamic risk management and risk assessment basis, constantly assessing the risks, listening to the clinicians and the people working in the, the, the ground involving them in how best to address and ameliorate the risk we identified so that we could make quick decisions uh, and informed decisions. And then the power of collective knowledge was probably one of the, 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 the uh, best things that we had because we were able to harness the collective knowledge of the entire team from our partners uh, in, in the, from, from the uh, construction team through to the porters and cleaners, to our clinical staff, to build up working at a working and safe hospital from the ground up. And we harness that knowledge, I think, very effectively. Key to all of this, and, and one of our key principles was staff wellbeing. And this was paramount because many of our staff were volunteers from across health. Uh, those were in practice, some were returned to practice. However, there were people who were in short supply and who would bring the hospital into operation if required. So we had to look after and make sure that that resource was, was well cared for. They were a key risk and a limitation. If anything was going to be a limitation, that, that was it. And that's probably why we used some fairly, some fairly well tried and tested techniques. We used the seven questions. Uh, and those those appear in the document that that Leslie mentioned earlier, and the rehearsal of concept drill techniques to move from work as imagined uh, to rehearse work as realised. And I won't labour the the, uh, the the techniques there in the, the the document, but in short, what we did effectively was to build a Blue Peter model of the Louisa Jordan in the the hydro. It quite literally was sticking back plastic, it was sellotape, it was cardboard, and we used up about half the, the floor space in the hydro to, to build this thing. And what we did uh, on day one was to have all the heads of departments standing around where their departments would be, and we went through a day in the life of a patient going through the, going through the, the NHS Louisa Jordan. From admission through to being transported to a bed, 
through to eventual treatment and discharge. And at the end of that, what I, I did then was to issue the clinical plan. Because I wanted people to orientate themselves to the ground first and then give them the clinical plan and said, look, the day after tomorrow, we come back, same time, same place. We will go through the clinical plan and I want you to tell me what part you play in the plan, how you're going to fulfil that part and what you want the outcome to be. Uh, and how you're going to liaise with others to make sure that that happens. So we did that on a number of occasions and we refined it down, refined it down, refined it down until we did uh, a day in the life within the ward using one of the ward teams, uh, complete with cleaners, uh, caterers, all the rest of the stuff and volunteer patients from Sodexo uh, who volunteer to be patients and go into the beds. We scripted probably what would be the worst day that you ever experienced in a ward ever because we had all sorts of incidents running at the same time, but we wanted to try and test the system uh, to, to make sure that what we had there was going to work. And if it didn't work, we just stopped what we were doing. We made the adjustments, we made the changes and we carried on. And that two two effects. One, it's it tested the system, but the other element that, that it did was it gave assurance to the staff that they were going in the right direction. It built trust between the, the workforce and, and the leadership. It gave confidence to the staff as well as building pride and it gave them empowerment because they were able to see if there's a, an issue, if we need to make a change, if the change makes good sense, we're going to do it and it'll be implemented quickly. It wouldn't need to go through a committee. It wouldn't need to go through any other process other than being ratified at the ward level that this was the right thing to do. Slide four, please. So the lessons that we took away from Lisa Jordan, NHS Lisa Jordan, were that cohesion, teamwork and trust were all part of, of the same, same thing. They were essential to achieving tight time scales and ensuring the required outputs. It wasn't easy, but the rock drill along with mature leadership, uh, which valued the workforce, allowed us to accomplish that. Clarity of comms at all levels, and that's communications down as well as communications up through formal briefings and feedback sessions. And we'll see some of that later on. And the regular checks that, that we made that messages were going out at all levels uh, and that feedback was encouraged, uh, again, helped us build that trust from the ground up. And we, you know, I see that as being a real key element uh, of going ahead. And it was certainly one of the lessons we took away. Establishing the common purpose was done at a very early stage. The plan was exercised, everybody understood their part, and everyone was invested in success. Developing a sense of urgency and momentum was another element that we we took that I took away from it, and it was about how you generate enthusiasm by the agreement of of common time scales. And I suppose we were enhanced by the the possible real world, world consequences of the opening date not being achieved. Much of the momentum and peace was self generated because everyone understood how relevant they were to the to the role. And manage risk to allow decision, quick decision making. This was crucial because we had to make decisions very quickly uh, and make changes quickly. And you'll see that later on when we talk about the check in to check out, uh, which is, is part of the the part part of the, the, the package. And my favourite one was removing unnecessary bureaucracy, and we were really quite ruthless on that. Start with a clean sheet showed how much baggage were accumulated uh, in terms of governance and admin etc and that needs regular review and housekeeping so i'll leave you with the the generate with the the generating triangle at the right hand side and we've got capability there we have got a uh, concept and we've got the physical component but without that moral component at the top we're not going to get anywhere and that was the moral component we concentrated on. 
Uh, if we move on to, to slide five, please, and that's the final slide. Uh, this is Louisa Jordan. Uh, it's the face behind the name. Uh, Louisa was born uh, 81 years before me, I have to say, but only two streets from where I came from. <clears throat> uh, she was part of the Scottish Women's Hospital that went to Serbia in, in 1914. She sadly died of typhus in 1915 and is buried in Niche uh, in Serbia. And ladies and gentlemen, I see I've, I've just about run out of time, so I'll stop there and I look forward to thank you for your time and I look forward to any questions you may have at the end. Thanks very much. David, thank you so much for sharing what has been obviously an extraordinary experience. I think the the chat box is quite quiet just now, but I anticipate as the session progresses that um, uh, there'll be questions for you at the end. So thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you, I think what we'll do now is we'll trans transfer on to our, our next speakers. So our next speakers are Lorna Turner and Karen McKenzie. Lorna is the lead nurse for quality improvement and standards in NHS Lothian. She qualified in 1994 and has extensive experience in orthopaedics and worked as a senior charge nurse for the orthopaedic trauma admission unit um, before she led the implementation of the care assurance standards at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. She is passionate about embedding a culture of quality and person-centred care and was appointed to her current role in 2020. Karen is a senior programme advisor within the healthcare staffing programme at HIS, but is also a practising speech and language therapist. She has specialised in working with adults with acquired neurological um, conditions and has developed clinical leadership and QI capability in a number of boards, including remote and rural services. In her current role with HIS, she leads on co-producing education resources to support skills and knowledge development in relation to the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Act and works with colleagues in the NHS services to understand and embed the principles of the staffing legislation. So thank you both for joining us and I will pass over to you. Thank you, Leslie. Good morning, everybody. Um, so um, together with Wendy uh, Drysdale, um, we have created a checklist tool to support teams and in particular the senior charge nurse when they are faced with creating capacity when systems are under pressure. Next slide, please. So back in January 2021, in my current role, um, I was asked to support a new Interpol senior charge nurse, Ban Sibin, while she navigated her way around opening a new 20 bedded rehabilitation ward to provide extra capacity um, within her site during a, another peak of COVID admissions. Um, and at the time, I created a very basic checklist tool for her, which incorporated all the factors to consider when opening a new ward. So although the senior charge nurse had been an experienced deputy charge nurse, this was uh, by far her first experience in the band seven role and was trying to understand the many distant different systems, processes and factors that she that needed to be considered to safely open a ward at pace. She was facing several different challenges, dealing with new tasks within an unfamiliar environment and dealing with a workforce unfamiliar with each other. She needed to build confidence and competence in her workforce whilst working at pace. She needed to build and enhance teamwork within a new team, focusing on communication and, and really important to her, her staff's well-being during this period of change. And finally, she knew she needed to avoid harm, but at the same time, increase her knowledge of all the risk uh, management systems. Next slide, please. 
So in April 2022, I was approached by Caroline Craig from Health Improvement Scotland and asked if I would be involved in developing checklist tools, building on the template I had created for the senior charge nurse back in uh, 2021 to support areas who required to increase capacity during periods of system pressure with, with a vision that it would be available for all NHS boards to provide a structured approach to opening a new ward changing the function of a ward or expanding the current ward capacity and and why so what's the purpose well i suppose having remembered how that senior charge nurse was feeling overwhelmed and stressed by the enormity of the task it was easy to see um, we needed to provide staff with a robust structure of processes to expand capacity efficiently and effectively ensure we provide a coordinated approach to expanding capacity involving all key stakeholders to ensure that the new ward environment change of ward function or expansion of beds adhere to current national and local policies and finally it to provide a process to mitigate risk allowing for informed decision making next slide please So how, how to use the tool? So we created this on Excel with uh, an idea that this would be used as a, a working document that could be downloaded. The tool can be used as a separate standalone document, um, allowing for any amendments and a version control, which I, which I think is key to keeping this tool relevant and an ever evolving document. So the tool is split into seven sections or tabs. Um, the first tab um, is guidance and really just summarises what I've just talked about in the previous slides. Tabs two, three and four are the new ward checklist, change of function checklist and expanding ward checklist. Uh, and the user would just go in and select which checklist matches your requirement. And then tabs five, six and seven focus on um, guidance on workforce uh, modelling, the workforce template and an example template, providing the user with clear instructions on how to populate the template. Next slide, please. So um, the layout of the checklist follows the same pattern. Um, the first section allows the user to input data and build their profile. So looking at who the senior charge nurse is, the consultants, um, the current or proposed ward speciality and current proposed bed occupancy. Um, it allows you to input uh, the current whole time equivalent uh, nursing staffing for both trained and untrained. Uh, medical staffing, sessions provided and potential sessions required, um, HP staffing whole time equivalent and also looking at your whole time equivalents for ward clerk or housekeeper. Then we move into the tool itself, which um, is separated into eight columns. Um, the first column is the theme, uh, and we've broken that down further to look at environment. And what I mean by that is the ward area, health and safety, security, fire, safety awareness, communications, telephone access, and domestic services. We then have a section around equipment, ward equipment, laundry, IT stores, top up, catering and clinical equipment that is required. We've also got an, uh, a theme around patient pathways and that's looking at the admission and discharge pathway um, into this new area or um, expanded area. Um, contacting e-health, escalation of deterioration, what is the process for that and um, also around your COVID screening. Um, the next theme looks at ward processes um, and routine communication, so thinking about informing staff of the shift times, if this is a new area that they're moving to, the handover times, the ward huddles, thinking about your MDT meetings, medication rounds etc. Um, and also really important as right considering staff's well-being and psychological support, the importance of uh, good robust communication um, and support, especially for those who are impacted by service change. 
And then the last theme uh, looks at workforce, um, considering your medical nursing, EMP and EHP staffing, your finance and your budgets, your new cost codes, your e-rostering and building that ward profile um, on your e-rostering tool. The use of the nurse bank, informing them this is a new ward. Um, and finally, thinking about your staff training and their competencies. So column two, just as it says there, it offers information on which department to contact, link into each of the themes, i.e. estates, health and safety manager, procurement, um, pharmacy, manual handling, etc. Um, and on reflection with the senior charge nurse I supported in 2021, this was key for her, knowing what department to contact or who to contact to provide her with the information she needed. So column three um, provides the senior charge nurse with information on things to consider and requirements to safely um, expand capacity. And I suppose this is the section that provides guidance on all the factors that usually need to be in place, but sometimes um, get forgotten until you need uh, that piece of information or kit. Um, so I'm thinking about the storage uh, space, the glove and apron holders, your door entry system and access, how many telephones you actually need, the arrest trolley, where that's going to be situated, drip stands, information boards above patients' bed spaces, your contact details for your staff, your manual handling equipment, um, documentation and, and I, IT access, how many um, computers are you needing? So column four um, provides links to uh, infection prevention control policies and procedures. Um, and we included uh, this was you know, due to COVID pressures. However, these checklists aren't just for use when there is a surge in, uh, in COVID cases. Column five allows the user to assign a particular responsibility to a member of the team. Um, and column six provides a review date and column seven allows the user to document the target date, giving all members clear dates and responsibilities that need to be worked to. Column eight gives the space to update any progress that has uh, been happening and column nine allows the user to comment on the status of the requirement and whether it's on track, completed or delayed. So therefore it's just making it a, a, a user document. So I'm going to hand over to Karen who's going to explain the workforce template. Thank you, next slide. Thank you, Lorna, for setting the scene there with uh, with with the tool. Um, in terms of the um, the workforce element of the the template, um, we were we were designing that for clinical and workforce managers so that they have a quick way to calculate the whole time equivalent staffing requirements, um, and importantly, that skill mix um, using professional judgment. There is that caveat, of course, that that will be used in conjunction with your specialty specific professional national guidance. Um, in terms of the, the purpose of the template, um, it really just gives clinical and workforce managers that way to ensure that the skill mix per shift includes that minimum number of your experienced substantive registered nurses and midwives. And of course, as the systems come under pressure, the total registered nurses and midwives, uh, you know, that can be altered um, as that as the staff availability is affected. So really key that there's that flexibility um, built into the template. And of course, we know that the skill mix may alter while you're trying to retain the overall number of staff um, to patients as systems come under pressure. Um, there is, of course, that recognition that um, as systems do come under pressure, um, you know, service and clinical models may have to change. Um, the professional judgment template that, you, you know, we'll, we'll show you a couple of screenshots of that um, in a second, used to identify the number of your staff required per shift, and that's going to generate the whole time equivalent staffing requirement. That's likely to, to be different um, from the current whole time equivalent staff. So, um, if we can have the next slide, please. Thank you. I appreciate that these screenshots will be a wee bit, might be a, a little bit small on the screen there, but we are going to share um, the the toolkit um, 
um, for yourselves. Um, at the, I think Lee's going to pop it into the the chat, or um, we'll be sharing the toolkit, so you can have you can go in and have a look at it. Um, in terms of the workforce, uh, the t t section of the the toolkit, what you'll see there along the bottom of that screenshot is um, you'll see three tabs there. You'll see the green workforce guidance tab that contains the aim and purpose that I've just uh, described to you. You'll, you'll see that uh, middle uh, tab there, which is a completed example. So that's that's always a good um, place to go to see how it looks when information's put in. And there is, of course, um, the, the third tab along to complete is, is a blank template for your use. Um, the blank template can be used to put your own information in. And um, what you'll see on the, the, the screenshot there is hopefully this is not going to be asking you for any information that you're not already familiar with. So um, for your local information section, um, you will see that there's guidance and, and glossaries around all of this um, within the guidance tab. Um, but that allows you to pop in your number of patients, number of beds, or, or you can put in number of beds, percentage occupancy. You can populate with either two or three uh, daily shifts um, and the, the rostered length of shift hours, um, as well as days covered per week. Um, there's there's a wee caveat here around the, the overall absence percentage here, which is to say that, um, that that's the local absence level. So, of course, we know there's the predicted absence level nationally of 22.5%, but we're mindful that local absence can differ significantly to that which affects your available staff, particularly um, if we think back to COVID times and the ongoing um, issues with, um, with absence. Um, and then you'll see um, in the final uh, section there, um, that's your current staff that are available in terms of whole time equivalents. So your total registered nurses and midwives. So that can be people who've come to the care, the, the care area. Um, they're not perhaps substantive, um, but they've come to um, work in that area um, and they're registered. Your locally experienced substantive registered nurses and midwives, of course, they're substantive staff who know the, the local uh, care area well. Um, and um, any other registrants and support workers, so um, other other um, registrants, for example, HPs um, who've come to, to support the, the work in that area. Next slide, please. So the next uh, section of the, the the template is the staffing requirements, and this is where you can you, using professional judgment you put in the ratio of uh, uh, the required number of um, registered nurses and midwives. Um, enter the ratio of the patients to registered nurse and midwife per shift. You can also do that for the experienced substantive um, nurses and midwives per shift. And the same again for your other registrants and support workers. So what is required uh, to, to deliver um, safely that work? Next slide, please. OK, this screen is probably going to look quite small, um, but um, just so that you can see how that pulls everything through and what outputs you get when you've popped your data in, um, you will see there that it will give an, a minimum number of staff per shift. So that's based on what you've put into the section above. Um, and that's the minimum you'd really need um, to, um, to safely staff the area. OK. The whole time equivalent there, um, which is the next section down again, is based on the information above. Um, and it will just also give you that um, read across. So if you look across to the, the whole time equivalent variance there, what you can see in, in red is that um, it's showing that there's a, a shortfall for all registered nurses and midwives based on what has been professionally judged to be required. So that gives a bit of read across in terms of the variance there um, at, at a glance as you put your information in. Um, what I suppose in terms of getting familiar with this resource and, and, and using it, um, you won't break it. So, um, you know, go ahead and practice with it, putting in your own information. If you're coming to a new area that you can practice by putting in the information from your previous area, just so you can see how it compares to what comes out in terms of the, the whole time equivalent. Um, and you can increase the beds um, or put info, information in for a new area. Um, and, and finally, just to say that um, you can always come back to uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland if there are any questions. We will share that toolkit 
um, and um, if there's any issues with it, you can get in touch with us. So I'm going to hand back to Lorna now, please. And if you can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, <clears throat> so we know working in an unfamiliar environment with new colleagues can potentially compromise on patient safety, impact on team confidence and competence uh, in that workplace. Staff are often redeployed from their usual practice areas to new environments. And uh, whilst this is necessary to provide uh, patient care, uh, this can create uncertainty across operational and clinical domains. Within NHS uh, Louisa Jordan, teams quickly recognised they required a system of communication and learning to ensure patient safety as well as supporting each other. So using a, a check-in for change model, they created a tool to gather insight and data for critical learning that in the moment. So the check-in for change model uh, follows a simple and quick check-in system developed to become an integral part of the handover and huddle processes. Changes can be done quickly without seeking permission or decisions from senior individuals. The focus is on rapid communication and action and the collection of simple data. So the data capture tool comprises of six questions and um, they are considered helpful to identify where changes are required to improve patient care, the environment or staff wellbeing. Potential risks may be avoided with on, on the spot fixes. So these are just uh, the questions there. What did what did we do well yesterday? What's going well today? Things that could be better. How are we feeling? What changes have we made? Things that we need to do. Uh, or help with. So staff uh, can note the issues uh, and apply a score to share, fix or escalate to the line manager or to a more senior executive level. Having these conversations helped uh, to identify risks, instigate change and agree issues uh, require an escalation. So uh, for me personally, I've never used this check-in for change model. I shared it with the senior charge nurse I'd supported back in 2022, um, just last week. She wished she'd had this been available to her at the time um, as she felt very isolated. And, and she used the words flying solo, dealing with many factors she had never been exposed to previously. She liked the idea of having a simple and quick check-in system um, involving the whole team creating opportunities to learn and adapt together and definitely could see this becoming an integral part of the daily routine at handover or uh, huddle processes. Next slide, please. That's me. Thank you for listening. Thank you both very much. Um, it's been fascinating talks um, from from all the speakers today. Um, the link to the toolkit, which is optimising capacity in healthcare systems under pressure. Um, Lee has just put the link to the toolkit in the chat just now. And um, all the tools and resources that have been discussed throughout today's presentations are in that. And as Karen said, you know, if, if there are any issues, you can always come back to us if you've got any queries around that. So more than happy to progress that. Um, I'm sure there must be questions that, that people have from today's speakers. Caroline, I see you've joined us on the screen. You've been monitoring the chat box. Um, so I don't know if you um, have any questions that you'd like to, to shout out from the chat box. But likewise, anybody on the call, please feel free to put your hand up and ask any questions of the speakers. And we'll, we'll, we'll manage that as we go along. So Caroline. Thanks, Leslie, and I'll keep a wee eye on the hands as well, so I bring those in at the same time. So my first question is from Brenda Wilson, uh, NHS Golden Jubilee. Thank you, Brenda. She's got a question for David. She wonders how you see these principles being applied and deployed into the boards to help develop those structures and strategies to address the current front door challenges, which we're, we're well aware of. Yeah, I, mean, it's, I think it's a difficult one. One of the, you know, I've alluded to during my presentation is that we we carry lots of baggage. And I think that at times, one of the refreshing things about Louisa Jordan was we were able to divest ourselves of all the baggage uh, and 
getting in about, you know, get back to get, get back to basics, for want of a better term. I think the Sc Scottish government uh, commissioned uh, a learning account on the Louisa Jordan uh, that's sadly still in draft, but that was intended to be sent out to the to the boards. Uh, however, what I would commend to the boards is, and you know, a bit of self publicity, I suppose, is you know look at the systems under pressure document because a lot of the stuff is in there. Uh, and also, you know, within that, I'm still still working. I'm at the end of the phone. I'm at the end of Teams. Uh, but what I, I don't see is a lot of the, the lessons that we identified of, you know, getting back to basics, taking away the, 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 the bureaucracy. I don't see much of that in the boards, uh, I'll be honest. And I can see that because I'm at the end of my career. Uh, so, so I can see anything I like now. But the, the, the fact is that we need to try and clear away a lot of that, that baggage. Uh, and I think once we do that, we can then concentrate, get back to what we're good at, you know, concentrate on patient care, go back to the bare essentials and the check in to check out piece and the check in to check in for change piece. I think is a really good example of that. And these are things that we can do ourselves. You know, we don't need the boards to, to, to do that for us. You know, and these are things that you know our band sevens, band sixes can implement in their own areas. And I suppose that's the purpose of the document. It's not a strategic document. It's one that's 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 uh, very operational and is is easily applied. What I would say though is that the the lessons, the rock drills, and the seven questions, all that sort of stuff, look at it in terms of principles. And these are changes that 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 you can make uh, in your own workplace. Thanks, David. I've got a question here from uh, Lisa Clare from the Healthcare Staffing Programme, and I'm going to open this up if I could to, to both Lorna and David and Karen, because um, she's asking in relation to workforce. So she's asked what kind of le uh, lessons can be learned from both directing the Louisa Jordan, but if I can extend that to opening the other uh, areas as well, where there was a real focus on um, providing staff for the pandemic. Um, and that was a real focus at that point of time. How can we take learning from that into our current systems that are really under unprecedented pressures now? So looking at the workforce, how we mobilised workforce, I suppose, to support those surge capacities that we did during the pandemic. What lessons, what key lessons could we learn now? Yeah, I suppose... John, oh, sorry, Carolyn, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, Lorna, go ahead. I'm, I'm probably going to say something very controversial, but anyway. Uh, so I suppose um, <clears throat> some of the learning that, that we've picked out is around when staff are uh, redeployed to, to, to certain areas. It's about their knowledge and skills and actually uh, understanding what they are and actually being able to um, direct staff with specific knowledge and skills to the appropriate areas instead of just everybody just goes out to certain wards and then that just builds up that huge amount of anxiety for that staff member because they're appearing on a ward and saying I, I could do this but I can't do that and then that adds a lot of conflict within ward areas um, uh, around staff coming to help um, you know, looking back to, to, to when the, the pandemic was uh, when it first hit so I suppose it is about understanding their actual knowledge and skills, um, the tool looks at that, what are they coming with uh, and actually uh, allowing you to build up that um, that template of a workforce to make it appropriate for your area. Thanks Lorna. David, do you want to come into that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's also about how we receive people. Uh, and it's that reception piece that I've found quite difficult at times. And, you know, this is not attaching blame to anybody because, you know, we've all been in the, the swamp, uh, trying to drain the swamp when you're, you're up to your backside in crocodiles. And it is difficult. And somebody coming in saying, you know, I don't think I can manage that. I can't do this. Can't. You know, when you're, you're already on edge uh, and it's back to that moral component. It's really, really difficult to to, to take a backward step and, and draw a breath on it. But it's about how we receive people in these areas. And, you know, a, you know, a smile 
a sit, quick sit down. OK, you know, make sure that you this individual is going to be safe in the area. What can you do? What can't you do? And then you just need to start working around that. Uh, and all too often, uh, and this is, you know, personal observation again, you know, it's 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 quite easy to to marginalise these folks coming in. Uh, and that reduces them. The, the, you know, I'll get back to the moral component. It reduces their their willingness to take to to to, to participate, to take personal risk, if you like. So I think if there's anything to, to, to be said, it's it's about acknowledging that there are going to be shortfalls and that there are. But it's about having that humane element, that human element, smile when people come in, uh, accept the help that they can get and work around the rest of it. And you know, I would cite the the uh, the call forward that we had during uh, during COVID, where I think we ended up in Scotland with something like seventeen hundred or so returners to the register. Uh, and we only, according to the NMC, uh, the NMC figures, and according to the NMC, only eight percent of them were used. So I think we need to start thinking in terms of resilience. How do we encourage people to be versatile? How do we encourage them to be agile? You know, in times when it's less, and it's never not busy, times when it's less busy, you know, perhaps during spring and summer, is there an active training process that can take place to try and attract people back in? Uh, is there a, an opportunity to move our band six, band seven colleagues around so that they're getting that experience elsewhere so they can better support people coming in? It's it's about being proactive and and saying we're not going to solve this problem tomorrow. We need to build resilience in now. How can we best do that? Thanks, David. Hope that answers your question. There's lots more questions coming in, so I'll keep us going if that's okay. There's quite a lot of recognition for the removing of bureaucracy and that starting with a clean sheet of paper. So there's a question from Jacqueline Shand from NHS Grampian. Thanks, Jacqueline. In terms of processes, in your wash up wins and learns, did you review that and feed that into? So I suppose what aspects of what did you learn that you've put back into mainstream uh, practice into services? Yeah, we've we fed back quite a bit into a uh, Scottish government into the debrief paper, and and I think that's you know it's it's still still not been been finalised. Uh, in terms of what I, what I fed back when I went back to NHS Orkney, it was the, the, the beginning of the review, for examples of policy, procedure and process. You know, do we really need a policy for everything? Do we really need so, everything written down? Or And that sounds heretical. Uh, but I think we need to be to be pretty ruthless and do some good housekeeping. We started that in Orkney. Sadly, no, no fault of NHS Louisa Jordan here sometimes. I ended up quite ill uh, in October that year uh, and only came back to work properly last year. And um, that's why I'm down in Highland and I see Williams on the call with a very distinctive avatar there, which is a true reflection of him, I have to say. But the what we're doing at the moment in Highland is doing exactly that. You know, we're reviewing our policies and procedures, partly driven because they were they were they were out of date, as you as we see in every vote. Uh, but part of that is is about asking the, the salient questions about do we need all this bureaucracy here, and that then leads on to our governance piece, and we you know again it's it's about this getting back to basics, and we've almost generated a, an industry uh, around all of this you know I mean I, I, and I don't mean to be disrespectful of quality improvement colleagues at all the, the methodology is absolutely sound. But at times it becomes almost a, it becomes a barrier, an impediment rather than a uh, rather than a tool to to take forward. And it's you know very much it's down to individuals. But I think we need to be really careful when we start to to use these things that we're we're doing them for the right reason. And it's and again another element that we're we're dealing with in in, in a Highland at the moment is we're looking at all our meetings within NMAP. And saying, do we need all these meetings? Because we're seeing duplication of effort. And sometimes these things just build up and build up and build up, initially for a really good reason. 
and then we we lose the reason why they were there, but they're carrying on. So I think there's lots of stuff that we can do that, that will start to cleave away. And the aim is to give more time, and it's to give leaders and managers thinking time, and it's to give our clinicians time to to, to do what we do best. Thanks, David. Um, I've got a couple of questions still in the chat box. Um, I'm going to bring in Ruth Thompson, who's popped her hand up, and then I've got a few, couple more. I'm hoping we've still got time. So over to Ruth. Thanks, Caroline, and I'll be really, really brief. So um, I supported Louisa Jordan after the build, so all the, the great work that David um, highlighted and was achieved within the first three weeks. Um, However, I don't want people to walk away thinking that Louisa Jordan didn't have governance structures because after that initial build, we actually did have to start looking at what mm. are the policies and procedures should we should we receive patients. Um, and I, you know, one, I think it was Lisa Clare who had said what would help. I really think once for Scotland policies and procedures would help. For example, Louisa Jordan, because everybody reached out to friends, colleagues and said, give me what your policies are. And we then had to look at how would we adapt and adopt those policies within Louisa Jordan. But we had something like six last offices policies. You know, so within a, within a very short um, time frame, that's what we had, uh, had acquired. So we did have to start looking at what can be actually done and delivered in a non-clinical environment. So I'm just putting it out there because I would hate for people to think that it was, you know, well, we'll see what happens when the patients <laughs> arrive, because that certainly wasn't what happened. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Yeah, just to, just to re reinforce that with, with Ruth, you know, it certainly it wasn't the Wild West uh, <laughs> by any manner of means. Uh, but I think what we were, we did, and, and Ruth and her, her, her guys did, did a fantastic job as well, what they, they did, we were able to, to, to look, we were able to look at policies as we, as we not as we needed them, but we, we, you know, we needed the policies, we needed the structures, but we were able to be very selective as to what we put in place because we didn't have any previous history. We were able to pick and choose the best of what was out there. But equally, we didn't have anything that was extraneous. It was it was trimmed as far as we possibly could, uh, because again it was all about you know, as Ruth said, it was a non-clinical environment. Well, yes, it was, uh, but it was a contingency hospital, and we we were you know if we'd taken patients and thankfully we didn't have to, uh, we would have required all the policies that everybody else has got. I think the difference was that starting from scratch, we were able to build them logically sequentially. And we were able to to have what we needed, as opposed to inheriting lots of stuff over many many years that, you know, sort of clogs the system. Thanks, David. I'm mindful of time, and I see we've got another hand up. So I'm going to ask Brenda if she'd be able to pop her question in the chat box, and we'll try and respond to that after the meeting. Because I've got a question here from Leslie, which is a nice one to finish on. Um, because I'm conscious of time, and that's with the gift of hindsight. Is there anything? The um the panel would do differently next time, and I'll ask that just to get really succinct. I suppose one would. Is there anything you would do differently? Uh, do you want me to come in on that one, Carolyn? Thanks, David. Yeah, I'd probably have hung the phone up and the telephone call <laughs> much earlier. Uh, when the CNO was saying, MacArthur, you're you're going to go, uh, because having done back to back tours from. 2003 to 2010 and then spent a month abroad most years. I promised my wife when I retired from the reserve in 2019, never again. This isn't going to happen again. <clears throat> I was called down to Louisa Jordan for three weeks and three months later I got home. Uh, so the thing I would do differently, I'd probably hung the phone up and uh, finish my soup. But we wouldn't have had this wealth of knowledge. Lorna, anything you'd do differently in hindsight or your senior charge now, she said a couple of things you might do differently. Um, I, I, I probably don't think so. I probably would have maybe been in contact with her a bit more. I was only covering that area probably once or twice a week. So, um, so yeah, looking back on that and certainly using that check-in for change model and potentially um, being more uh, available um, 
uh, and actually including probably the, the the whole team within that um would probably be what I would I would do differently Thanks, Lorna. Although having known you during that period, I think you were a lifeline to, to that senior charge nurse and we've captured all that learning. And I'll hand back to Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Um, so we are running close to the wire on time, but I think that just shows um, the richness of the conversation that we've had today. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to our speakers today. Um, obviously, their presentations and their experiences have generated quite a rich discussion. Um, we are aware that there are questions that we haven't answered in the chat box. If you leave them in the chat box, we will come back to them and, and get an answer for you. I also want to say thank you to all of you who have attended today and given up um, time within your busy schedules. We don't take it for granted and really appreciate um, you taking the time to join us. I'd also like to give a shout out to um, the project team within HIS who have been working in the background that make these events run so seamlessly and we absolutely could not do that without them. So massive thank you to them. Um, our next webinar is on Thursday the 8th of December at two o'clock. It's around the theme is maintaining quality and safety at the front door. Um, so uh, Tracy will be popping the link to the chat, uh, the link to the registration in the chat box. Um, so I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible there. Um, also, we have a, a feedback form that we would really appreciate if uh, you would be able to take a few minutes to, to fill out. I think your, your feedback is really important to us and we would really do look at it because it helps us inform um, our next sessions and how we involve them. As I said, we don't take your time for granted and we want to make sure that these sessions absolutely meet your needs as best as possible. So if you wouldn't mind filling out the, inf the evaluation form, the link's going in the chat as well. That would be much appreciated. As you know, the session has also been um, recorded and um, the link to that will be circulated in a week's time. Mm. But thank you, everybody, and hope you have a good rest of your day. Take care. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.